All right. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Ken and Steve and Jim for your participation and George in just a few minutes. We thank you uh, for your willingness. We're sorry that we're not uh, live from the standpoint of in person, but we are live from the standpoint of virtual and we are thankful that you are with us. We hope that you stay safe today. Uh, safe better than sorry, of course. And so we hope that you have a good day. Uh, as Jay mentioned in the announcements, we started last Sunday, Invest in a Friend. If you don't know what it is, I'll be glad to talk to you about it. Those that were in attendance though with us last Sunday, hope that you got off to a good week with that, uh, that you got started with it and and uh, that you've been praying for those individuals. And and we'll have more to say. We'll remind you from time to time, not talk about it every week, but but uh, we'll remind you from time to time and and uh, hope that you'll, you'll keep that program in your heart and in your mind and in your prayers, most definitely. This morning, I want us to, to discuss a lesson entitled Listening to God. Back, uh, it's been probably seven or eight years ago now, I was watching the news, and the news commentator made the statement that there, were, there was a, a college that was going to have a commencement speaker, and they had invited 25 different individuals to which to all of which the student body had said no to now they finally i forgot who it was they they finally found somebody and and did have a a commencement speaker but someone asked them said why in the world did you go through such a list of 25 people and the individual that was responsible for securing the speaker said well said as we would find these people and find that uh, we thought that they we knew that they would come but we thought that we would tell the student body and these were folks they didn't want to hear we thought that they would have great messages but the student body didn't want to hear them well you know that that's sad it's sad that we are not willing to listen to folks that maybe sometimes can give us a, a bit of of hope and cheer and and good admonitions whether we agree or disagree with them Listening is is very difficult to art. Now we can hear things and not listen. I'm guilty of that. Unfortunately, I'm guilty of of hearing my wife as she talks to me, but not always listening the way I need to. Listening is the idea of taking what is being said or what is being done and being able then to make application into your life into such a way that you grow from the conversation, if you will. You know, God speaks to us. God has, through the years, spoken to mankind. A God, in biblical times, spoke by means of dreams and visions. He also spoke through people. He, he speaks or spoke to them through uh, dreams and things that they would see, but he also... Uh, spoke through his word, spoke directly, a direct revelation. Today, God still speaks to us. <clears throat> he, he speaks to us through his word. That's the way that he speaks. Now, admittedly, you might say, well, wait a minute. Doesn't uh, he work and thus the discipline of the Lord that's mentioned in, in Hebrews 12? Doesn't uh, that uh, isn't or isn't that rather a means by which he speaks to us? And I think so. But it's not, as you would say, a direct revelation. It's more of a teaching of principles, uh, of ideas that we come up with and find in his word. And he speaks to us in many ways still through people today as they share his wisdom, his comfort, and his words with us that he truly does use people today. But God really speaks to us through his word. And it's not so much, if you will, the speaking of God that we want to talk about today, but it is the listening, our part. God has, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Spirit of God has, if you will, allowed the Father, God the Father, to reveal himself to us. And that's what the Bible is. It is God's revelation of himself to mankind. And so, you might say, well, sort of underlying all of this preacher is the idea that we read and that we study and that we meditate upon God's word. Well, you're right. 
But in doing that, I have to ask yourself or ask you, how do you listen? How do you listen to God? Because as I talk to people and have through the years, as I've talked to them about uh, their relationship with God and their relationship with regards to following his will, sometimes I find it lacking. Sometimes I find it in great shape, but sometimes I find it lacking. Well, what's the problem? Well, maybe it's just due to the fact not how God reveals himself, as we've said through his word. It's not what... uh, he said, but it is how we want and how we listen. So this morning, let me give you some food for thought and really how you need to listen to God. First of all, you need to listen to God dependently. You know, we're we're not self-sufficient, are we? I think I told you not long ago, I enjoy these uh, shows on TV, these do-it-yourself shows. These folks that go in and basically uh, make nothing, make something out of nothing or tear down a house or virtually gut a house and then fix it all up. I enjoy all of that. I don't do any of that. It's not really my talent, but but I enjoy watching it being done and those that have that craft. Well, there's a show that uh, used to be on uh, a channel that's now, I believe, called the Magnolia Network or Magnolia Channel. But anyway, it's entitled Building Off the Grid. And it's the idea of someone building in some place that no one really inhabits and no one really wants to be in. And it's uh, usually in Alaska, but it's, uh, I think they've, I've seen houses built in Montana and Wyoming and a couple of other places. But the idea is, is for the individual to be there, live there, and to live without the help of others. But if you watch the show, you find out there's, they are not sufficient. They're depending, if they're building a house, they're dependent upon the lumber mill, and they're dependent upon the lumberjack, and they're dependent upon the fellow that makes the screws and makes the nails. You see, they're dependent upon people. And, and the reality of it is, is that we're not self-sufficient. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, our sufficiency is not of ourself. Well, who is it of? Well, Paul answers that. He says our sufficiency is of God. Sometimes we become arrogant spiritually. We, we don't need God, we think. But Jeremiah said that he knew that the way of man was not in himself. It was not in man that walks to direct his steps, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23. So what we have to do is listen to God dependently, knowing that he's the one that gives us what we need. He's the one that gives us the life that we need. He's the one that provides for us from the standpoint of our needs, both physically and spiritually, and we might ultimately say eternally. We're dependent upon God. The Bible tells us that. The Bible tells us of God's great strength. In First Chronicles chapter 29, David is coming to the end of his life. The, the temple, of course, was built, but David blessed the Lord before the assembly, as right before Solomon was anointed, and before David, uh, as it, like I said, as David's uh, life ended. And in First Chronicles 29, verse 12, David makes this statement: "Both riches and honor come from you," and the "you" there is referring to God. And you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand is great strength to give strength to all. And then he jumps down to verse 14. But who am I? Who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. You see, David said, Lord, as he was trying to build the temple and God would not allow him. And of course, Solomon ended up building the temple. But David says, God, we know that you're worthy of such great praise and honor because of your greatness, your power, your strength. 
and we are dependent upon you. Man does not have that strength, that power. And so we we really need to be reminded that God who provides everything for us physically and spiritually, that provides for us that eternal home. Remember Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so we're reminded we need to remember that God, who according to 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, keeps us, provides for us, that it is his counsel that will direct us. And it is afterwards that he'll receive us into glory. Psalm 73, verse 24. You see, we're dependent upon God. And we need to listen to God dependently. God, you know, I I need to, to listen to you because you're the only one that can provide for me. Oh, you've given me talents and you've given me ability and you've given me jobs, but everything I have has come from you. I'm dependent upon you. And so listen to God dependently. But secondly, secondly, listen to God attentively. Give your full attention to God. As you read and study his word, give your full attention to God. It's it's easy in this day and age to, to be distracted. It's easy in this day and age to really not just hone in. You know, we have, as a society, we have become people that really do multitask. You know, we we turn the TV on and while we're sitting with the TV, we're reading a book or looking at our, our smartphones or, or we're, we're doing something else. And while you say, well, you know, I can do both things at once. Well, maybe you can. But if you only do one at once, you do it a whole lot better. When we spend time in the study of God's word. And when we allow God to speak to us through his word, we should really be almost as the the young girl that is in love with the the football player, the, the star quarterback for the team. You know, she's sitting on the edge of her seat with every word that is said. She's listening. She is intent in hearing everything that he has to say. Or it's like a a man watching a ball game and all of a sudden, you know, there's things going on around and maybe he even, shh, shh, I need to hear this. Or when we watch the news at night, maybe we're that way. You know, don't don't break break the the atmosphere. Don't break the the concentration. Let me concentrate on this. And so we're, we're dependent upon every word. We're listening listening with all of our attention. Well, we have to admit the devil is in the details, isn't it? In the details with regards to to God's word, in the the minutia. Now, I believe that through the years, many people have argued too much about too many things that really don't matter. And they've tried to include the minutia of the detail. But I also believe that there is, has been, and there is currently in this day and age, there is a turn, if you will, to to disregard what we want to disregard, to only want, if you will, the big picture and not see the, the little details that God has given to us. To give you an example of what I'm talking about, how about We all like the idea of being saved, but not all of mankind likes everything God has to say about how we become part of his family and how we are saved by his grace through faith. You see, the 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 crux of the matter is, is how do we listen? Do we listen to every word or we just listen to some words? When Satan tempted Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. Remember, Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. As a matter of fact, the text tells us that afterwards he was hungry. When Satan comes to him, he says, strike the 
strike the stone and turn it into bread that you may eat and be filled. Do you remember Jesus' answer in Matthew 4 and verse 4? It's a, it's a wonderful answer. It's an answer that we really need to, to concentrate and think about. Because in Matthew 4, verse 4, Jesus simply says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word that comes out of mouth of God. Not just some words, not just a few, not just what you like, not just what you want. But when God speaks, you listen. I know we recently studied this, but I, to me, this is probably the best simple answer for this point. We just studied it in Sunday morning. It's found in Genesis chapter 6. That when God looked upon man, it grieved man, that, or grieved God, excuse me, that man had turned into such a rebellious individual. And God found one that had found grace in his eyesight, and it was a man by the name of Noah. And so he told Noah to build an ark. Now, I want you to think about a couple of things. I want you to think about what the Hebrew writer said with regards to Noah. In Hebrews chapter 11, the Hebrew writer says Noah moved because of the warning of God, but not because of things that he had seen. In other words, more than likely, there'd never been a flood up until Noah's day. Now, if you take Genesis 5 and you take it as a, a chronology that is complete, the world's only a little over 1,500 years of age at the time of Noah. And so Noah had never seen a flood. Nobody else had ever seen a flood. But God told him to build an ark. Now, now think about this. God told Noah to build an ark that was to be 300 cubits in length. Now, a cubit was anywhere from 18 to 22 inches. So to build it 300 cubits long, to build it 50 cubits wide, and to build it 30 cubits high. God also told Noah, he said, I want it built out of gopher wood. Don't, don't want it built out of just any and every type of wood. I want it built out of gopher wood. And I want you to put pitch on the inside and the out, outside so that it will be watertight. It will be waterproof. And Noah, I want you to put a door in it. And he told him where he wanted the door in the side of the ark. And then he told Noah, he said, I want a window. I want a window in it. And he said, this is how I want the window to be. And he gave Noah uh, the instructions. And we know, we know that Noah and as Peter says, Noah and his family were saved. But we ask ourselves, how was that? And how did all that come about? How did Noah spend all of those years doing what God had told him to do? Well, that's the key. You see, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 23, we see there the text says, Thus did Noah according to all that God had commanded him. He didn't do some of it. In other words, he didn't say, God, you know, gopher wood, uh, there's only so much gopher wood around here. Or, you know, pitch within and without. Why don't I just, why don't I just put the pitch on the inside, God? Or, or a door. Hmm. Uh, a door. Okay, we need a door, but we don't need a window. We got a door, God. And on and on he could have gone. But he didn't. Why? Because he understood that every word God had said was important. And so he did according to what God had told him to do. When we read God's word and we look and think about the idea, say, of Christian worship, and we sometimes say, well, you know, it's not that important, or these things with regards to worship are not that important. And the reality of it is, is that we need to listen attentively. God, what are you saying? What are you saying to me? How do I need to, to, to do? What do I need to do as far as my part in all of this? And so listen to God dependently, listen to him attentively. Thirdly, listen to him confidently. 
We place great confidence in people, don't we? And we place great confidence in things. We do that really almost every day. We do it with our spouses. We do it with our children. We do it with our society. We do it when we drive down the road, don't we? We, we place confidence in, in people, that the people that constructed the road constructed it safely. We place confidence in the people that as we're driving one way, they're driving another. And we place confidence in the fact that they're going to stay on their side of the road. Now, I know it doesn't always happen, but that's the confidence we place in them. We place confidence in things because as we're driving, we drive over a bridge. We have confidence that that bridge is going to hold up. Well, we could go on and on, but you get the point. When we place confidence in things, but sometimes we don't always place complete confidence in things, do we? In John 8, there were those with Jewish background and Jewish leanings that really just didn't trust what God, what Jesus was saying, what Jesus was telling them. And they wanted to know, you know, how how was he God? And and they just they were just having a hard time believing that Jesus was the Son of God, and he was the one that the prophets had prophesied about. And they really were trying to hinder Jesus. They were trying to stop his ministry. And so finally, Jesus, if you recall, in John 8, verse 44, rebukes them. He says, you are of your devil, and the lust or the desires of your father you will do. For he was a murderer from the beginning and bowed not in the truth. And so he says, remember to, to trust, but trust in God. We need to trust in God because God's words are, are completely true. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in all the Bible. The psalmist talks about the Bible. And in verse 160, he makes the statement that the sum total of your words are true. And so we can we can talk about, well, how do we know that this Bible is inspired? How do we know that it's from God? How do we know that it's complete? And, and admittedly, there are those questions, but I believe we can answer them with an affirmative in the fact that the, what we have is complete, what we have is from God, and what we have is to be followed. And so what we need to do then is as we study this word and as we hear it explained to us, we need to wholeheartedly believe what it says. What it says will come to pass will come to pass. What it says is yet to be will, will be. And what it says did take place did take place. You see, in many ways, we've seen the past. Oh, maybe not literally. No, I wasn't around when Noah built the ark, when Abraham uh, went into a strange land. I was not there when Moses led the children of Israel across the Red Sea. But at the same point in time, too, I believe those things. And so I know I've, I've seen the past through God's word. But as much as I've seen the past through God's word, I also can trust in the present that he is a God that, that will take care of me, that he is a God that's watching over me. And so I can trust him with regards to then the future, that it will come to pass. And I can trust in him. I can trust in the Lord with everything I've got. I can trust in the Lord for everything I've got. And I can trust in him with everything. Psalm, the psalmist makes the statement in Psalm 34 in verse 22, the Lord redeems the soul of his servant, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. You say the Lord knows the future. He knows the past, admittedly, because he was there. He's seen it, yes, but he knows the future. And so I place great confidence in him. When he talks about heaven, I ultimately say, I want to go. I want to be there. When he talks about walking through life's paths and always being there with me, I have confidence that he will be and that he is. You see, nothing is impossible for God. Matthew chapter 19 
and verse 26. But I'm reminded, as Paul was in a ship in Acts chapter 27, being tossed about to and fro, as the sailors there, and maybe even Paul himself was unsure that they were going to come out of this unscathed and they were going to come out of this alive. And God revealed to him that revealed to Paul, that is that he would go to Rome. So when the revelation from God ceases, Paul goes up above and he tells folks, he says, Hey, look, God has revealed this to me. And he says, I believe that it shall be even as he told me. There's the promise that we have just as, Paul said of Abraham in Romans chapter 4, verse 20, that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. We need to have that faith as well that believes God. And so as God speaks, we simply say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What would you have me to do? I'm willing to do it. You want me to worship you upon the first day of the week? I'm willing to do that. You want me to 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 be a good representative of you, to let my light shine, to be an individual that basically sees you, the Savior, in me and through me. I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to, to base, if you will, even the salvation of my soul and eternity upon you. And so we listen confidently. But we next we listen openly. Yeah, it is true. We hear what we want to hear, don't we? And we only hear what we want to hear. It's only what we like. You know, you, you've you had conversations where people remind you of stuff and you say, well, you know, I, I don't remember that. Yes, but you remember this over here. You see, that wasn't in your favor. And so you don't remember that. But this this was in your favor and you remember it. We We have to remember that we have to listen to all of God's narrative. We have to fix our our ideas and ideals and our views based upon what God has said. And we don't just need to say, well, you know, I like this. And I'll, I'm going to take that and I'm going to run with it. I don't like this. And so I'm not going to take it and I'm not going to run with it. You see, we often want to hear messages that are of hope and happiness, and harmony, and holy ideas that have that heavenly pitch to them. And I agree with you. I like those things as well. But there are times which we also need to be rebuked, which repentance needs to be called upon, and which we need to have a restoration and even be our souls be restored to our first love and to our relationship with God. You see, we need that balance is really probably the word that we need. When Paul would talk to Timothy about what the Bible is and how where it came from, he said in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. But he also says that, that it's profitable for reproof, for correction. Now, there's your negative. So in sometimes Paul says the Bible's got to reprove you. It's got to set you straight. It's got to correct the error of your way. But it's also there for instruction of God. Not just for instruction, but sometimes to set you straight. And so we we are reminded even of that very principle and reminded as well of that very fact in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, where Paul told Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. When Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and to lead the people, one of the things that as he got to after the walls were rebuilt and you get to Nehemiah thirteen, you find out that the folks had problems. They had problems with regards to violating the Sabbath and with regards to the temple. And yet Nehemiah rebuked them. Jesus openly rebuked the Pharisees in Matthew 16. Moses openly rebuked Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 10. 
we need to hear all of the word of God. And so we open our ears and we're attentive to the things we like and the things we don't like, the things that, that go with the way we live, but the things that don't go with the way we live. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, those two chapters, where the seven churches of Asia Minor are addressed and some of their problems, some of their their difficulties, some of their sin is brought to their forefront. And in each one of those little short epistles, if you will, the Lord says, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear. Let him open up his, hear, his ears to hearing. Let him hear what, what God says. You see, Maybe the psalmist is right in Psalm 32 and verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity. I've not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. We can say yes, but to a lot of things. You know, if my wife says, this is what we're having for, for lunch, I can say well, I like that, but I, I, that's not what I want. So, yes, but. I know of a man that that's what he did many times to his wife, and she grew discouraged in cooking, so now they go out to eat just about all the time. And I tried to, to talk to him about encourage your wife, help her in the kitchen, but also, you know, eat what she fixes, man. Listen to God. It's not yes, but. It's yes. You know, I like that idea, Lord, but I've got this idea, or but I want to live my life this way. Story is told, as we move forward, story is told of a preacher friend of mine that had a young lady that came in, and she explained her life and explained her life situation to, to him. And he pulled out the Bible and he showed her, showed her in her life where some things needed to be corrected. And she went away and as she went away she said you know I can't follow those things because I believe the Lord wants me to be happy well the Lord does want us to be happy but we also have to ask what does the Lord want he wants us to follow his will and so let's listen to the Lord openly one more very quickly let's also listen to the Lord reflectively in other words let's meditate upon what he has said and what he has told us to do. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul would write to the young preacher Timothy, and in verse 7, he would remind him to consider what I say. May the Lord give you understanding in all things. You see, that's all that God asks of us. Consider what I'm saying to you. Consider what I'm telling you. And so sometimes we have to do a little self-examination when we get into Bible study. Oh, am I measuring up? Am I where God wants me to be? Paul would remind us that if we think ourselves to be something when we're nothing, we deceive ourselves. But let a man examine his own work, and then he'll have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Galatians chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. So as we study the Word of God, we look reflectively Okay, is this what I'm doing? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I doing what folks of, of biblical times did? You know, we can look reflectively and sometimes we see our flaws. That's what Paul did in First Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. When he looked back over his life, he said, oops, oops, I, I, I've made many, many mistakes. He talked about it in Philippians chapter 3. He talked about his, his, his past. He looked reflectively. And as he looked reflectively on where he was and what God said, he ultimately changed his life. In listening to God, let's listen reflectively. Let me give you these right quick. Listen dependently, listen attentively, listen confidently, listen openly, listen reflectively to God's word and to God and what he tells you to do and to his, to his very speaking to us today we thank you for listening this morning i hope that you have a safe day may god bless you and keep you and look forward to being with you tonight god bless